Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays of the month, except for the first Sunday of every month. I do a subscriber Sunday video where subscribers send in photos of things in their yard that they're proud of. If you're interested in sending in photos for that, the email address is right here. Just mark the email subscriber photos um, and also turn your phone sideways if you're using your phone to take pictures because YouTube is a widescreen format and not an up and down format like uh, Instagram is. I wish they were the same, but they are not. Okay, um, did a lot of video uh, content here in the uh, last week and a half or so uh, in this yard. Uh, lots of progress going on in the front yard and uh, various projects going on back here. Um, uh, I've got several videos actually that I've shot that I haven't edited yet. So uh, lots of content coming up as well. So kind of excited about that. Thanks everybody for following along. I got tons of questions on last week's video. I won't be able to get to all of them. Uh, and I just, I, I think I wrote down 12 or 14 or something like that. So quite, quite a few questions I am answering. Um, if, I don't, if I don't get to yours, you can ask it again. Um, if I don't get very many questions this week, and sometimes that happens, I'll go back and collect some more of them off of that, uh, that list from uh, this past week. There's a playlist on my channel called Question and Answer uh, Videos, and it's up here. I'll link it up here in the corner if you're watching on YouTube. I've answered a lot of gardening questions uh, at this point in the three years that I've been uh, doing this. I think there's like 60, 60 videos or something like that of just question and answer videos. So let's get started with uh, ones from this past week. I had somebody um, in Tennessee, but they're actually, they're in zone 7B, ask me about growing Osmanthus fragrance and whether or not it would be okay. Since most of the time, most websites are going to uh, list them as zone 8 uh, and above, like 8 to 10. I'm in zone 7B. Uh, this is an Osmanthus fragrance uh, right here. Uh, hopefully you can see that. And it's in, it's in full flower right now. And there's nothing that smells better in this world uh, to me than Osmanthus fragrance. It's the perfect sweet fragrance. Evergreen shrub, um, great border plant. It's offering a great, this is great screening plant here. I think you'll be fine. But things that are marginally hardy, I typically want to plant in the spring. So where I would say that fall is the best time to plant woody trees and shrubs for the most part. If you think it's marginal or you think it could be an issue, um, you might want to spring plant it. That way it has a full season to get established before it, it before its first battle with winter. Uh, also, the other thing is, uh, even though mine is fine here in 7B, this space right here, I've got the woods behind me, I got the house right here, I got another house right there, I mean literally right beside me. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of wind coming through here. So if you're in an area where it could any plant could be marginal, don't plant it right out in the middle of a field. I mean, that's definitely gonna just invite the winter to do more damage to it for sure. So. Um, uh, you know, protect them, put them up against a house, put them in a space where the winter wind is just not going to wail across them all winter long because that'll desiccate them. Well, what will happen is the, the soil potentially, um, the, the wind is so dry in the winter time that the wind blowing across a plant can take water out of the leaves much faster than the roots, which are kind of dormant, uh, can pump water back up into the top of it. So um, you get that desiccation uh, in the wind. So I want to explain that. So um, pretty clearly. Okay. Um, somebody asked me about the green and white gourd that's on the uh, front porch, um, which is actually a squash. I think it's that, uh, uh, Kushaw squash is actually what that, um, uh, uh, is. If I'm pronouncing that right, Kushaw. I've already seen that word my whole life, but I've never, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody actually pronounce it, but it's a green and white, uh, squash, uh, is what it is. Um, and it is, they are, they are beautiful. And a lot of times you can get them where they'll stand up like that. And then, Sometimes they're kind of flat shaped, um, they, just different shapes depending on how they grew on the ground. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, somebody asked, um, they, get, they see variegated plants um, or photos of variegated plants and they want more of a white variegation on the leaves. Um, I've got a uh, Juliet Clara over here next to me um, that would be an example of one that has probably a little more yellow in the variegation. They see some that have a whiter variegation or yellow variegation, and uh, then they'll go to look at them and they look very different than the tags. Yeah, the photos on the tags, I don't think anybody's trying to trick anybody, but you know, the, it's not necessarily the best photography on a tag somebody paid, you know, three cent for or five cent for. Um, so um, it, it would be hard to read, but they were looking at Euonymus and said they were yellower in the uh, store. I think that. Um, you know, golden euonymus is definitely on the yellow side, but if you wanted one that had more of a creamy white variegation, silver king euonymus actually has the creamy white variegation. So there's some of both. Um, even even something like a variegated 
a privet or this gold privet right here. Um, uh, Swift Creek privet has a very yellow variegation and I see some variegated privets that have more of a creamy white variegation. You'll see that in variegated plants where some are creamy white and some are, some are yellow. And it can change, I think, a little bit in the ground just based on how much sun they're getting and um, you know, just, just the conditions that they're in uh, even, la even later in the ground. Okay, um, let's see. Somebody uh, is allergic to bees and wanted some plant suggestions for around their door um, just because they don't want bees. Uh, I can't remember what they said they had there already, but um, I, I think obviously boxwoods, you know, come to mind anytime somebody wants a, you know, a, a plant that's not going to flower and, and attract bees uh, to the space. Of course, Japanese hollies uh, are like that as well. And some dwarf Chinese hollies like Carissa holly would be a good, good example of that. Um, uh, non-fruiting Chinese holly. Um, uh, dwarf Burford would flower and, and attract bees, but uh, Carissa is the dwarf, little dwarf one. Good foundation plant, just in general. I had some at the old house. Uh, let's see. And then uh, dwarf Nandinas came to mind because the dwarf nan the newer dwarf Nandinas don't flower. And so, uh, you know, they would be rugged uh, foundation plants that would not flower. Um, Old-fashioned Nandinas do flower and, and, and would probably attract pollinators to the space. So there's there's a few there's a few ideas, but there are some non-flowering um, non-flowering non options. Okay, um, and dwarf by dwarf Japanese hollies, that's the small leaf hollies. Uh, that's going to be Hellerai, soft touch, that touch of gold holly that I planted back here that I have a video for, uh, sky pencil hollies, uh, Steeds hollies. There's a bunch of Japanese hollies, but it's the little leaf uh, hollies, and they're they're the one they they they're not going to attract bees. They'll, they'll occasionally flower a little bit, but um, uh, very insignificant. Okay, let's see. Uh, putting, okay, somebody wanted to know about putting, um, they wanted to just grind their food waste and apply it directly to their plants rather than going through the composting uh, process. Um, I don't think it would have any negative consequences to your plants to ground up, um, you know, food waste and apply them directly, but I think you could end up with pests. You know, I, I don't know that, you know, it could smell bad, potentially, I have no idea. I have no idea, but I'm, I'm thinking that it probably would draw pests in, flies, um, potentially smell bad, that kind of thing. I would run, I'd run any kind of waste product through your compost and get it, and go through that heating of the compost and then apply it and get the nutrients out of it that way. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody um, has a white fly issue, massive white fly issue, uh, on a lot of their shrubs uh, in their yard and uh, uh, had been using. Um, can't remember what they said they were using uh, on it, and they wanted to know if those if the white flies would overwinter. It depends on the severity of the winter. White flies do um, get on the backs of the leaves and uh, just in overwinter. In severe winters, a lot of them will die out. But they, it kind of doesn't matter because they breed so quickly in the spring. By mid to late spring, you can go from a couple white flies on a gardenia to just what seems like millions uh, very very rapidly so i don't think it matters how many survive the winter if if a few do you're going to have a white fly issue my biggest white fly issues um, at the nursery were always just plants touching one another so if i plant a gardenia in the middle of this backyard it's unlikely that i'll have many white flies if i put it up against the foundation over here and it never gets any breeze on it never has any air on it no circulation around it, I tend to get white flies. And we saw that in the nursery when we put a thousand of them in a block uh, and uh, other plants as well that are susceptible to them. That's why white flies are such a pest in greenhouse operations because there's really not a lot of air movement in there and the white flies just, just have at it. Um, they're soft bodied insects, they have a hard time, um, you know, if a 30 mile an hour wind comes along, uh, it's not, not necessarily good for them. Um, so it, it could be the spacing of your plants, um, some, some pruning, some thinning, maybe taking a few things out, maybe deciding that um, a couple of the things, if you do have something like gardenias, may not be the best call in that space that you have them in. And then uh, from there, using insecticidal soap um, is probably a, um, a good idea uh, as one remedy. There's, free, there's a lot of times I'll take a water hose and I will just absolutely blast uh, insects off of things. If I have a heavy insect problem and I, I figure if I killed 80% of them, I've helped the plants enough and um, I move on with my day. So that's another strategy I use. And with white flies, that's, that would be effective. It's not going to take them out, but you can lessen their numbers dramatically uh, and help the plant uh, in, the, in the meantime. But really plant spacing is kind of key with 
key with white flies issues. Okay, um, a new somebody has a newly planted camellia. They wanted to know um, about uh, the watering schedule on it. I'm having to water more right now than I probably have in the last couple of months. We had several tropical storms hit the Gulf and they exited out. They exited out through North Carolina over and over and over again. We got tons of rain and now all of a sudden it's not raining at all. And I've actually had to do some watering uh, this week. So if you've got something that's newly planted, you want to check it. Just pull the soil back and uh, make sure that it's you know that it's still moist. Once it becomes dry, watered very thoroughly. When to stop that? I don't know. I mean, it might maybe sometime in December before you don't need to check it any longer. And then in terms of any anything you need to do on that plant over winter, I'm not going to worry about it at all. If your camellias are hardy in zone seven to nine, so if you're in zone seven, potentially the first winter in the ground could be an issue if it was extremely cold. So if we had nights in the low teens or maybe single digits in the very first winter that camellia is in the ground, you might want to throw a sheet over it or something like that. Um, that may be something just to think about. I doubt we'll have a night like that, but if we did, um, if you're in zone eight or nine, this is not even probably something you're going to have to think about at all, but um, that's your camellia information for its first winter in the ground. Uh, water it if it needs it well and leave it alone otherwise. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody it was in Franklin, North Carolina, which is out in the western part of the state, and their Japanese maple had dropped all of its leaves already. And mine back here in the container um, is starting to get some fall color, but really, um, and most of the Japanese maples I'm seeing in this area are just starting, or really just starting to color up. So it probably dropped them a little early. Usually when plants drop leaves early, it is a sign of some kind of stress. I don't know what that stress is. Um, I don't know if it was um, abnormally dry. I don't know how long this thing was in the ground. I don't have any more information than I just know that plants that drop their leaves early are typically under some sort of stress that stress may be self-correcting uh, and, and be no big deal. And so I'm just going to wait for it to leaf out next spring. It's probably going to be fine. Cherries in my area now, um, and I mean all cherries in my area now, defoliate uh, in the uh, late summer. I've got one across the street from me over here, virtually naked. For whatever reason, cherries just don't even go through fall color in Raleigh anymore. They just go and all the leaves drop off. Um, they're clearly heat stressed or drought stressed or something's going on um, with the cherries, uh, with, with, with most of the Kwanzaan cherries and the Yoshino cherries in my area. Um, let's see. Um, so I know there's some kind of stress going on. Uh, somebody asked me about truly full sun plants, meaning <laughs> lots of things are tagged for full sun, but everybody has that spot that's not only full sun, but they got a brick foundation and you know, it's just, or it's next to a driveway or asphalt out by the road, that kind of thing, where the sun, it's not just the sun, it also has kind of a heat sink where it doesn't cool off during the night as well. And so um, everybody has that space. And so there's lots and lots of plants that I would tag, you know, full sun out here, but then know that it probably wouldn't work against a brick wall, you know, on the west side of the house. Uh, just, just, you know, there are plants that just won't tolerate that. Um, but then they're in zone seven, and so definitely abelia come to mind. And I planted those um, radiance abelia out in the front yard this week. But basically any abelia, this doesn't matter. Those things can just absolutely take torture um, for sure. Indian hawthorns, definitely. Although a lot of Indian hawthorns now have disease issues, so you need to find a disease-resistant uh, Indian hawthorn, um, which, which do exist. Spring Sonata is one I've shown on the channel. Uh, Eleanor Tabor I've shown on the channel. It's a little dwarf pink one I had on my foundation at the old house. Love that plant. Never had an issue with that plant in 23 years. I'm sure they're still doing great right this second. Um, but that's Eleanor Tabor Indian Hawthorn. Uh, Snow White and some of the old Indian Hawthorns have um, uh, serious uh, leaf spot issues and, and, and dro drop the leaves or cospera or whatever it is that's causing, it to, to, causing them to defoliate every summer. And then um, any Chinese holly. And so um, depending on how tall you want it to get, you could use dwarf Burford that might get five or six feet tall, Carissa that would get three or four feet tall, but they're definitely going to take absolute baking full sun. I see Carissa hollies planted in, in islands all over the uh, city of Raleigh where, you know, right down the middle of the road. Uh, same thing with Abelia. Um, so there's a few things. Um, somebody asked me if they needed to dig their caladium bulbs in zone eight. Caladiums are typically hardy in zone 9 to 11, 
And so probably in zone eight, you do need to dig them like people need to dig dahlias in zone four, five, or six and store them for the, uh, for the winter time. Uh, you would have to do caladiums down to zone eight. But <laughs> there are new caladiums, and I've, I've seen a lot of the trials. Uh, I've been to several trial gardens in the last couple years where uh, I've seen caladiums that are, that are clearly more cold hardy, ones that are coming back every year. Uh, so I think, we're, I, I think there's a lot of effort being put into caladiums that are, uh, that are perennial and colder regions. I don't know what yours are, so if you wanted to keep them, I probably would, um, probably would uh, dig them. Okay, all right. Uh, somebody asked me when to fertilize trees and shrubs in the fall, and I just don't. Um, you could, after, after everything is dormant, you could apply fertilizer if you wanted to, whatever organic fertilizer that you want to use, uh, well, whatever fertilizer you want to use, because, but it's just not going to do anything. The ground's cold, the microbes are dormant that usually that make those nutrients available, and uh, it's just really not a lot of purpose to it. So that's why I wait until February or March, and I fertilize everything at that time. I do make sure the ground is mulched and, uh, and I keep my leaves and I grind those up. So there's some things going on here that can feed the plants, uh, but I don't directly put additional nutrients on through a fertilizer uh, until the late winter or early spring. And I'll put up a video when I do it. I've done a fertilizing video probably three years in a row. You're going to see a fourth one, I'm sure, uh, next year. Okay, and then somebody has, um, I talked about digging up dahlias last week. This person's in zone nine. They don't necessarily need to dig up their dahlias, but um, they have them in containers and uh, wanted to, or, or they had, a, oh, they needed to move them. That's what it was, but they don't have a cool spot in the winter in zone nine to keep them cool enough to keep them from coming back up uh, and wanted to know what to do. I just transplant them. I think in zone nine, you can just transplant them from one space to another. Just make sure you don't overwater them. In the winter time, it's very likely, well, not likely, but there's some possibility that transplanting them in the, late fall or winter, uh, they could end up um, wet. Uh, and, not, not, and just nothing they can do with that water because the roots aren't there and there's no foliage on the top. So it's just kind of sitting in overly moist soil. So um, just be careful that you're not putting them into a wet area. Boom, okay. Uh, somebody has a row of cryptomeria, uh, like Yoshino cryptomeria. It's a large growing conifer. Well, there's dwarf ones too. I've got, in fact, I have one called Twinkle Toes that I put on Instagram today that's this tall in a container. And then I have, I have two other dwarf cryptomeria in the yard, but there are cryptomeria that get gigantic, 50, 60, 70 feet tall, Yoshino cryptomeria that people use as screening plants. The neighbors, I guess, space is invading them with ivy and vines, and they wanted to know if, uh, um, uh, if they, they, I think they saw the video I did of the nursery that does the pot and pot trees where they put they take one pot and a sleeve and slide it into the uh into the ground and they wanted to know if they should do something like that to keep the uh to i guess to keep the ivy or whatever from rooting in um to that space i think you'd end up having to water them non-stop that pot inside of a pot means that it's a potted plant and it's going to require you to water them virtually every day after they've been in that pot for any length of time that nursery was watering those plants every single day and so that's what that would require if you put them in some sort of pot and pot system. The other thing you need to know about that pot and pot system is it's got gravel underneath it. And so that, that bottom pot can actually drain, okay? It's not a pot sitting directly in the ground. Otherwise, when they put water in that pot, it would fill up with water. So there's the drainage system under that system as well that I didn't talk about in that video. I probably should have. So uh, keep that in mind. This would be a very expensive thing. I think, unfortunately, what you're gonna have to do is uh, as is fight those uh fight those vines you know with uh you know with 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 a weed eater and with you know with, with whatever cutting whatever cutting you got to do on them to keep them back and keep you know keep a mulch layer between you and them just so you can you know stop the invasion before it gets to the trees every time um not a good answer work <laughs> work is the answer to that question uh okay um and then the last question for this week somebody asked me um, if, if all leaves could be used, I've been talking about using leaves as mulch and whether all leaves can be used as mulch. They've got a sycamore, which of course has the big uh, giant leaves. Absolutely, they can, any, any leaves you have can be used. Um, they do break down a little quicker and a little more readily if you'll break them up some. And you can use your lawnmower, which is the most inexpensive way to do it. You can put them out on the, you know, put them out someplace and, and just run your lawnmower over them. Or you can get a little tub grinder 
uh, that you can get on Amazon. Uh, I've got one in the shed over there. It works pretty good. Um, you just put the dry leaves into the top and it spits it out the bottom, kind of ground up. If it's not an area you care whether it's unsightly or not, you can just use the, leave the leaves where they are. Just don't let them be piled up against the trunks of your plants and that kind of thing. I, I shot the November checklist video today and I talked about in the checklist video, don't leave leaves piled up along the bottoms of your plants. Do go and pull it back some, even if you're gonna leave them in place and use them for mulch. Um, Cause it's just a place for pests, you know, to potentially hide and keeping the stems wet on the plants is uh, poten potentially an issue. Um, as well but yes any leaves will work uh i probably don't want diseased leaves so i'm gonna i'm gonna eliminate that right now uh that potential uh question i don't want uh, you know so diseased leaves like something off a hydrangea where the leaves were spotted or that kind of thing dispose of those but any leaves that come off these trees uh, you can leave them in place or rake them up and grind them and then use them and the one of the best uses for them is to use them like as cover for your vegetable garden if you have a vegetable garden and you pulled up all your summer stuff and it's just sitting there bare, um, you know, four or five inches of ground up leaves on the top of it would make a world. It would would, would help your vegetable garden uh, next year and it would keep the uh, weeds from overwhelming it during the winter time. OK, um, that was a good amount of questions. Uh, thank you guys for participating in the uh, Sunday question answer videos. And uh, if you have gardening questions, you can ask them down below. It will be two weeks before there's another question and answer video, though, because next week is Subscriber Sunday. Um, and uh, th again, thanks for participating.